hours with our speaker yesterday, Ken Irons, and he can talk far more than I ever thought about talking. <laughs> My wife's in school in the UK, well, actually, Carnegie and Lexington. I wish she had been around yesterday so when I got home, I could have said, you're not going to believe this, but this guy wore me out. <laughs> she said, oh, you didn't get saved. Your parts all the time. No, I didn't. We, we had about almost 10 hours together, the city manager and I, and Catherine, that senior's in our team of development, economic development department, and uh, we walked the whole town and went in a lot of places. Some of you may have seen us and uh, talked to a few of our vendors, merchants, and so forth. And it's, it's, it's so great to get somebody like this to come to our hometown as quickly as he was able to schedule with us. And let me say thanks ADP, thanks Commissioner Clark uh, for putting the bill for this. Uh, people like that, you know, Ken Gibbs is here with our alliance. And Tim, would you like to? Welcome everybody on behalf of, of the whole umbrella that we're all under with you. Well, I, I think you're doing a great job welcoming people. And I appreciate uh, just being a, a soldier in the Army, so to speak, and to That's start all, this journey. That's all we are. Uh, are and uh, Tim and I, every chance we get, we try to pat each other on the back because we're criticized all the time. Probably. <laughs> we don't hear about it. That's good. I don't care. I mean, we don't hear about it. But anyway. We're, we're all working hard together, and I just look around, I see people who come to some commission meetings, and especially ones that there are some topics that will affect all of us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to introduce him very quickly, but I just need to say to you uh, a couple of things like, we're an older community, an aging community. Uh, we we kind of don't have this midpoint and it's probably a lot to do with the lack of the major employers that we used to have. But uh, we have these uh, millennials uh, that are major, major participants, and we need them to do more. We need them to be more active than uh, just promoting the economy in our community. We want you to be active in helping make change. Uh, change is difficult. Um, over half our people, 55, 60 percent, are over 55 or 60, and they paid their way. They paid our way. They've done all the things you do as a good citizen all these years. <coughs> Many of these people are unable to come to a meeting like this, or unfortunately, some of them think they're not players anymore. What they think uh, is not important to people, but it is. And we're going to try to make make. Uh, way with some surveys from the city about things that the planning committee that's going to be meeting this afternoon, tomorrow, Friday, many of you are on it, uh, and they weren't just picked out because these are always people who do everything. Well, that was one of the reasons I think that we to pick some people, that they would show up, uh, like some of your employers, getting people to show up for work and keep working. He's tell students <coughs> at school some of the most basic facts about interviewing and getting a job. You know, sometimes you get a job, you got to work then, but just showing up and, and trying to do a good job. And we all need to emanate that in each of the business we're connected to, which affects the whole downtown. The downtown is the heart of the community. And we have so many people that I mentioned out in our neighborhoods that um, they may or may not be able to get out as much, or maybe they're fine. But they trust us, they, they trust you, they trust people that are trying to make things happen. Um, and I trust them. And, and I'm thrilled. We didn't have a clue, Roger, how many might come this morning. We, we tried to do all we could to get that flyer out, to get the word out, we've contacted you know, who, who we thought were uh, leaders in our community that are always standing up saying, what can I do? And I see a lot of you here today. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that you are here today. And I think you're going to be impacted by what Roger has to say. The manager and I were in a 
Toledo City's meeting three or four weeks ago in Covington, and five, six hundred mayors and city managers, and and he, being the kind of speaker he is, Wes, we thought he's talking to us. I mean, as he talked and, and did his presentation, the manager and I kept just punching each other. You know, he ha he's, must have been national. You know, he, he's had to been here. But I think you'll see what I mean by that as you see how this unfolds. Uh, he's he presented, coming I mean, cities, several in Kentucky, but all over, all 50 states and internationally. And, uh, you know, it, they're always an expert if they're not in town. And <clears throat> they carry a briefcase and they come in from somewhere else, they're experts. Uh, I checked as soon as I saw him yesterday morning, he did not have a briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't shut up all day. <laughs> but I want to tell you, I don't know how he does it because you'll see the enthusiasm, the energy he has as he's presenting, and he means every word of it. And if we're going through town, and he says a couple of difficult things, uh, like <clears throat> right here, this corner, this building should be a restaurant. It should not be a service center type business. And I think, okay, uh, which of my commissioners going to go in there tomorrow and say, look, you, you're not doing my business. <laughs> 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 and then we've got to find a restaurant to go in there. So, Benny, it's, it's more complicated. But he, he gave us such an overview of walking up and down Carter and Winchester in particular of, of what should go there. What sh you should try to, when it comes vacant, he didn't say that part, I'm sure he meant that. <laughs> but even uh, to the point where you try to get the retail industry on, on your front door up and down your street. And uh, we've got, uh, you know, one, one person is, that I've toured the G.C. Murphy building as Dr. Jedna, lifelong friends. Well, actually, he was a student when I was coaching. It's not like we grew up together, but we feel like we did. He chairman of our park board, and he's done an unbelievable job on G.C. Murphy building. We toured the entire building yesterday, which obviously I'd never been in all of it. I mean, every floor, the basement, I was in there almost daily, certainly every Saturday when I was a kid. But what he's doing to that building is just going to be unbelievable. And he's working hard on getting a couple of different uh, companies, retail on, on both sides. He is doing, he's restoring that. And much, much like some of the work that Perry Madden's been doing, and if you see some of the work he's done on the Henry Clay, and I remember how it used to look, obviously. I remember when I was coaching the National League, had our first banquet, basketball banquet, in that ballroom. And I had been there to proms and other dances, you know, as a high school student. And, and Perry, you're, you've been a developer in our community for years and years. I want to thank you personally. And we got somebody like Edie Javin is, is just picking it up. And one day he said to me, you know, Mayor, I, I really don't need to be doing this, but I want to do something for my downtown, my city. And he keeps telling me how old he is and how short time he and I have. I said, "Be, <laughs> I'm a lot older than you." He said, ten years." I mean, you know stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just told him. I said, "You know, you can't. Don't look at it that way." Well, he may feel like that some days because of the, what he's trying to do over there. I mean, he's a doctor too, you know, and he has patients every day. But this place is going to be a show place right in the middle of our downtown, and it's going to be a draw because. The, the people and the business he's, he's been talking to and wants to talk to, they're going to make a difference. They're going to be a destination. And I know we're small town America, but we can be a destination. Now, whether you're a big, you know, you're excited about our sculptures, uh, they're going to be a big deal. They're going to draw people from all over the country. Whether they stay long, how long can we snag them? Whether they say, wow, what a beautiful old town. Might not be a bad place to move to. You can do anything here. I mean, you really can get anywhere from here. But everybody's working together to make this a more inviting place to be. 
And it's like, <coughs> I'm the number one cheerleader for, I think it's the, the greatest town in America. And it's mostly because of people like you who show up. What can we do? What are we doing? What are we thinking? And this guy is an expert in the field. He's a good person. He's got a message that will impact all of us in this room. And it'll, it'll give you a lot of thought-provoking reactions. And I'm sure you'll have questions and accept them from you. Um, be careful about him. He's, he's really short fuse kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, because I tested him several times yesterday and said, what are you, what are you talking about? How can you do that? I mean, you got to do that sometimes to people. Um, but we're proud to have you. I think we're fortunate, and uh, I hope that it impacts you in a reasonable degree that it impacts the city manager and I, because we think this is a major step for our downtown revitalization that all of you in this room, whether you have a business or you, or you frequent a business, whatever the case may be, because you're here, you're a valuable citizen that's, that, that it's important to you to find out what's going on in your town and maybe have you be part of the improvement process. Be, be part of what the things that we think need to do better and we all can do better in everything. But, but some of the people have already had some impact on our community. Thank you. God bless you for the work you've done. Roger Brooks. How is everyone? Great. Doing good? It's been fun being here this week. And like the mayor said, um, I was speaking to the Kentucky League of Cities up in Covington which is an area we worked in next door at Newport on the levee, and we've had a chance to work all over Kentucky, which, and, and I honestly don't say this everywhere, I think it's the most beautiful state in the country. Um, I mean, it really is amazing. I hail from Seattle, go Hawks. Um, I, I did my internship for the Seahawks, and then, uh, but now we live down in Arizona, so it's always great to to be back in Kentucky. We got to work on the Bourbon Trail, and I got to dip my first bottle of Maker's Mark in the red wax in Loretto, so it's, it's just amazing. But I had never been to this part of Eastern Kentucky. We've worked up in the Columbus area and everything, but I had never been here. I actually flew into Columbus, came down 23, and then the, and, uh, Apple Maps took me around on 52, which is a gorgeous drive, and then it came over the bridge. I mean, it's just stunning. And you have a great downtown. So first thing to, we're just going to get going is if you see anything you want to take a picture of on here, you can. But there's also going to be a handout. So if you wanted to take a picture of this, you say, I want all those slides that Roger put up there. That's how you get them. And I'll leave that up there. But, and it is case sensitive. But if you say, OK, I want all these slides he has, that is how you can get them. And I'll put that on several slides, that little bit.ly there, bit.ly. And that's how you can get those. But this is kind of the presentation I gave at the Kentucky League of Cities, although I changed a few things to make it more about Ashland than the whole state. But everything across the country is changing in terms of demographics, governance, tourism, economic development. And this has been the greatest shift since the invention of the automobile and electricity as far as downtowns go and as far as communities go. And to start things off, one thing is really true is that the way it used to be is no longer an option. People always go, we wanted to go back to the way it used to be and it doesn't, it's not gonna happen. And I hear this everywhere all the time that if we could just go back 20, 30, 40 years, not happening. And I could have put Leave it to Beaver up there. Instead, I picked on Andy. So this is all about shift happens. And the very first one I want to talk to you about is this one. Jobs, this is the biggest shift ever. In the, in the past, your economy was built on river and rail. You were a steel community. I mean, you know, whether it's oil, whether it's gas. Almost every city in America was founded on either a natural resource you know, agriculture, timber, fishing, mining, you name it, or it was built on transportation or a combination of the two. And so what do you do when you say, what's our second act? When you've lost that core industry, what's our second act? 
But for the very first time in U.S. history, jobs are going where the talent is or where the talent wants to be. So if you can be, if people go, oh my gosh, I really want to live in Ashland, then they will come here. The jobs will come here. My son used to work for Amazon from Seattle, and he worked for Amazon. He was part of that whole thing when Amazon was looking for their second world headquarters. When they're looking for their second world headquarters, they're looking, where would our employees want to live? That's what they were looking for. They weren't looking for, oh, where's the nearest airport and the freeways and all of that. They were looking for quality of life. And that has changed everything to where community development, you as locals, are leading economic and tourism development. That never happened before. And so welcome to the age of peacemaking. So the next part of this is that every single elected official across the country, from President Trump, from your mayor, school boards, your governor, I don't know, who is your new governor? Did they decide last night? So, so but their whole job is to improve the quality of their life for their citizens. Every city, every town. That's their job. How do we improve the quality of life for our citizens? And if you do that, that's placemaking. And so that's the responsibility. And so your mission is to become the most desirable place to live in Kentucky or Eastern Kentucky or the region, which might include West Virginia, Ohio, the states right next to you. That's your mission. So how do you do that? And if you do that, the jobs are going to come. See, it's not the other way around. We used to do what we call smokestack chasing. We want big industry to come here. And what's happening is they're bringing in site selectors and stuff, and they're going, would our employees want to live here? So it's a different mind shift. The second part of this shift is that we're in the age of economic gardening. Across the country, what we're doing is we're looking, can we take smaller businesses and help them grow? So that's economic gardening, where we start small and we help them grow out. I mean, that's exactly how Amazon started in a garage. Apple started in a garage. Microsoft started in a garage. And those, all these corporations, they started small, and that's where we're at now. So the days, there's no question we want factories, we want industry and those things, but really the future, particularly for rural America, is going to be economic gardening. And so I want to give you the 10 ingredients that will get, can, that will get Ashland where you want to be. And, and because it's, you've got all, the, all of the bricks and mortar, all of the nuts and bolts are here, it's how you put it together. So here's what you do. The first thing we want you to do is create the Destination Ashland team. Now this might be Ashland in motion, it might be, I think you got different organizations here, but we need a group of people, and when I say the word destination, it's not tourism. How do we become a destination for investment? How do we become a destination as a place to live, raise a family, retire? And how do we become a destination for people to visit? And so if you start this team, and I'm going to give you how to, how to do this. The reason I always talk about putting together a team is to get out of the silo mentality. And I hate the word committee. To me, committees always meet and have meetings for the sake of meetings, but nothing ever gets done. Probably never had any of those in Ashland, though, right? Didn't think so. Because now we're in a global mentality, and you as a city need to stand out. Like our, the world is at our fingertips in a fraction of a second. And so all the cities and towns, 422 cities and towns in Kentucky alone, let alone the two states right next to you. And you know what? Competition is fierce. I call these the economic development dudes battling it out. Every one of the 422 cities, I am sure, in Kentucky want the same businesses that you want. So why should they pick you? What gets you to stand out? And the first way to get noticed is to get out of the silo mentality. And this plagues every city. 
where we have the, the, the city does their thing, community development does their thing, economic development, auxiliary organizations, Rotary, Kiwanis, all of those. And we've got downtown tourism, you know, chamber of commerce, the alliance for you, education. And everybody's doing their own thing, but they're not working together. You can even add to that arts councils, historical societies, local foundations. And this is the typical economic development express. They're really clipping along, aren't they? And that is a major, major problem. Can you imagine any company, Apple, Computer, anybody, where they all did their own thing? They'd be gone. And so these organizations in particular represent the private sector. The private sector is the future of Ashland. The city can't make businesses come here. The city can help set the stage for it, but at the end of the day, these are the people that need to take the lead. And by the way, you're far more powerful as one loud voice locally, just as you are to separate small voices. This is why you have a Kentucky League of Cities that represents all 400 of them, or almost all of them. Or you have the Kentucky Office of Tourism. I mean, all of those. That's why you have that and you need to have it locally. So the second part of this is you need to engage your millennials in this team. This is one of the biggest shifts in American history. The millennials, there they are. Do we have any millennials here? Boy, there's the years. Okay, how many of you are kind of pushing that? You raise your hand anyway. Yeah, okay. But so you need to be here. And you're probably going, Am I, you think he's going to pick on us again, right? Are you tired of getting people picking on millennials all the time? But here's the scoop with the millennials. First of all, they're the best education, educated generation in U.S. history. The bad news is they're starting life in a mountain of college debt. You know, that's, that's tar, tough on them. But they're the best educated, they're the most diverse generation in U.S. history, and they embrace it. And one thing that's really important to know, they're the most civically minded generation in U.S. history. There are more mayors under the age of 35 today in the United States than any point in history. They want to be engaged. They need to have a seat at the table. And the last thing you want to do is be at the seat at the table of the good old boys network. And no offense to the mayor or anybody. I'm just talking about that old, the, the Andy of Mayberry. You know, we're Mayberry. And so this is really important. And so you've got to engage them in the process. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you a story of Irwin, Tennessee. This is a little town of 6,000 people. This is it fairly recently because they've narrowed the streets, widened the sidewalks, but they have a history that's not very good. Back in 1916, there was a parade going down Main Street. They had a big, they had the circus was there. And so they had a parade going down Main Street. It was wider at the time. And in that parade were two or three elephants, and there was this one elephant named Mary. And they had a trainer on the back of Mary, and the sidewalks were packed full of people, and somebody over on the side, a vendor, was cutting up watermelon. Well, ho, ho, elephants love watermelon. So Mary started wandering over towards that watermelon, and this trainer, who was kind of a rookie, yanked Mary back, and he sat there and he whipped Mary to get her to go down the street. And Mary would kind of go like this, and then she would just kind of wander over towards that well. He was wearing spurs. He dug his spurs into her. She grabbed him with his trunk, threw him on the ground, stepped on his head, killed him. So the town of Irwin publicly lynched Mary the elephant. A hundred years later, they say... Somebody say, where are you from? They say, Irwin, Tennessee. Oh, my God, you guys are the people that murdered Mary the Elephant. But there was something else that happened. That was their brand. A hundred, and, a hundred years later, so in 2016, the mayor went out. They lost a major employer. And the mayor said, I got to do something. I have to do something about this town. I mean, that's our brand. What people know us for is an incident that happened a hundred years ago. So you know what he did? He went over to the high school seniors and town of 6,000, I think there's about 120 or so in the graduating class. 
he went to them and said, okay, seniors, how many of you are going to go away to college, you know, when you graduate? And almost all of them raised their hands. And he goes, what my big question is, in five years, six years from now, when you're done with college, how many of you plan on coming back to Irwin? 10% raised their hands. 90%, their motto was, when I graduate, I'm blowing this town. Happens all over the country. So he went, okay, what would it take for you to come back? And people started raising their hands. And you know what? Not one of them said, we need to have jobs. They all want a quality of life. Then he went to a 10-year reunion. So this was in like May, he went to the seniors. And then in August, they had a 10-year reunion. He went and welcomed them back, and about 75% of the class was there. And he asked them, welcoming them back to Irwin, how many of you live in Irwin? And it was about 20%. And then he asked them, for you, the other 80%, why don't you live here? And they were raising their hands. They are saying, there's nothing to do after 6 o'clock. Um, um, I mean, they went through the whole list of things, and it still wasn't about jobs. It was about quality of life. So what he did is he created a young professionals group. He had five or six in it. Now there is 40 in it. And he basically said this, Millennials, I'm turning the keys of this town over to you. If we can afford it and it's legal, we'll do it. And so they would bring ideas to the mayor, get it approved, and then they were turned loose to do it. They started doing public markets, farmers markets. The first thing they did was an elephant revival festival. As a matter of fact, the millennial group found some acreage and they created the only elephant sanctuary in the United States. You know, what's really interesting, the very next year, Barnum Bailey hung up the tent. Those elephants are in Irwin, Tennessee. They even went so far as to get these elephant replicas, which they actually sell, and they had artists decorate them. They're all over town. But they did some crazy things. Mayor, what do you think? Would that be okay if they did that here? <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, there's beautiful historic town. But the point is, in Irwin, he said, you know, whatever it is you want to do. And so there were a couple of things they started doing. They just started, he let turn loose. And, and they did some pretty cool stuff. They did a weekly farmer's market they didn't have before. And it drew people from 30, 40 miles around. They were a dry town. Restaurants can now sell liquor. They're like you. They're kind of a, what we call a, a moist town. And so they can now sell liquor. I mean, they did update the zoning so that upper level could be residential, live and work. So if you had graphic design or you were on the internet or whatever, you could actually live and work in upstairs loft apartments. And they put condos in former dilapidated buildings. And it wasn't glue down carpet and suspended ceilings. It was kind of the cool, rough-hewn brick, the historic brick and everything. And they, people snapped them up like crazy. I mean, nine new businesses opened for the first time in 20 years. They did all this in 24 months, by the way. And then the president of that Millennium Group is now the city's communication director. They, a, a microbrewery opened, and the third one is about to open. This is a little town. It was like 70% vacant in their downtown. There's developers coming to Irwin. Festivals are a big draw. More visibility of town, more local pride. It changed everything. And by the way, if you cater to the millennials, you're going to get the Gen Xers and the boomers. And I, tell, I talk to millennials all the time, and I go, you know what? We like hanging out with you, whether you like it or not. And that's true. You cater the millennials. We did that in Asheville, North Carolina. We catered everything to the millennials because it was like you, an aging population. When we were working in Asheville, if you've ever been to Asheville, when we were working in Asheville, the average population, the average age of a citizen was 56. And now the average age of a citizen in Asheville is 34. They did that in 10 years. And it's one of the best destinations in the United States. The word foodie is tied to Asheville. And so 
There you go. I mean, that's all three generations are shaping American cities. Here's what happened is, when Ronald Reagan was president, we deregulated airlines. Also, before that, if you wanted to travel somewhere, people dressed up in suits and skirts and everything just to get on a plane. And after deregulation, the boomers were the first people to go over to Europe and see cities wrapped around piazzas and pedestrian thoroughfares and all of these things. And then the Gen, X, Gen Xers went over there in college and they would backpack around Western Europe and they would you know, stay in hostels and everything. And now the millennials, they're, they've gone there as exchange students or with their parents. I mean, they're all coming back and going, why aren't we doing this in America? Why did we build our, our entire culture around the automobile? This is why you need to have the millennials at your team. So now, create the team. If you want to create the team, we're working on that right now. I would absolutely have somebody from this hotel. This hotel really is as good as anything you'll find in Cincinnati, anything you'll find in Louisville, anywhere. And you have it here. I mean, I got to tell you, when I walked into this hotel, I was pretty shocked that this was in a town of 20,000, 22,000. And so this is, I think you need to have represent from economic development. So you'd have them representing tourism. Now, I know that you do have a county tourism office, but this is 100% about Ashland, 100%. And so you need somebody to represent tourism, and this is a big investment for the city and, and for the property owners. So economic development, I would have arts and culture. I'd probably have the Paramount. The Paramount, you know what? I came from Seattle. There's a Paramount Theater in Seattle, which is like the 11th largest metropolitan area, and yours is just as good, if not better, in a town of 20,000. Pretty phenomenal. So build Ashland, which is kind of your, yes, we need, we need the booster club. Educational, whether it's school district, you know, the Ashland Alliance, uh, Ashland in Motion, your downtown city planner. And I know city planning and economic development are there, but you need to have both disciplines involved with this. So this is kind of your mayor, your city manager, parks department, young professionals, major employer. And by the way, I usually say try to keep it to 13 or less. The bigger the team, the less likely you are to get anything done. And if there's millennials that are in any of these other ones, I would have them there front and center. And towns across America creating this. This is downtown rapid, destination rapid city. And they revised that. I'm going to show you something about that. And they did everything. The mission of destination rapid city is to create, sustain, and maintain a vibrant city center which provides a cultural and recreational space for the enjoyment and use of community and its visitors. I mean, this is one that's fairly recent. This is destination Caldwell, Idaho. To position Caldwell as Idaho's premier gathering place. Notice a common theme in these? Because when you put together this team, you're going to go from that to this. Notice it's green. That's the color of money. And when you put together this team, we actually created a thing called Destination Development Association. And it's free through the end of December. And it's, there's videos on there of how to do all this. So there's a video there, you want doers, not directors. So out of those 13 people, we need people that will go to Kiwanis and Rotary and we'll go to the city council. We'll, we'll go out there, we'll, don't, we'll, we'll give two or three hours a month to pushing Ashland forward. Not come to meetings and then just go back to business as usual. And so there's a whole resource center, there's a video there. We'd love to, this is the first thing we want this team, the core team to do is watch this because they're going to put together the Destination Ashland priority list. The first thing on that list, and here's number two, is what is your unique selling proposition? You know, we have the world at our fingertips in a fraction of a second. I can find any town, anywhere. But you know what? If you go on the web and you type in Ashland, Kentucky, and go, woohoo, we're at the top of the list, you're the only ones doing it. Because everybody else is looking for something else. And by the way, I can find out everything about you. The second, the second the mayor and Mike, your city manager, came up to me at the Kentucky League of Cities, he said, we're from Ashland. And my first thing is, why are you here from Oregon? You know, and, and they go, no, this is Ashland, Kentucky. I said, where's the location? They said, Eastern Kentucky and everything. So when I left the conference and I was on my way back home, I just went on the internet and typed in Ashland, Kentucky, and I could find 
I can see you know, where it is. I, now I know your area code. Welcome, there's, there's the city website. Wikipedia, of course, I went to. You know, what is Ashland, Kentucky known for? It was kind of a blank steel kept coming up. Um, then we found out, you know, how far is Ashland, Kentucky from Portsmouth? These are questions that people ask on the internet. That's why those are there. So people are asking these questions. I can see what downtown looks like. I can see where you're located on the map. I can see that you're a home rule class of Boyd County. I mean, I can see your elevation, your weather. And then, you know, I, the Highlands Museum points of interest. And you know what? In a minute, I had kind of a good feeling about Ashton. But remember, there's 19,500 cities and towns in this country. I can find out information about any of them. So, you know, I even find, look at that. It says, who is Naomi Judd married to now? <laughs> Must be a popular hot topic. So, you know, when you go through this, and I did, I went through Wikipedia and I started looking at that. But the other thing we'll do is we'll go to Google Images. If we're looking for a place to live, we'll just go Ashland, Kentucky. We'll just look at photos and we'll see. Does it look good? So the more photos, having photo library and putting them on websites and everything, Google will populate those. When I saw the picture of the hospital, this is the hospital that's here, right? Right there? Yeah. That was pretty phenomenal. I hadn't seen it yet. And I went, whoa, the medical facilities here look top notch. And you know how I got that impression? From one photo that just popped up on Google. 92% of all Americans have instant access to the internet. Probably 100% of the people in this room could get it right now. And out of that group, 95% use the internet to decide where we're going to live, where we're going to raise a family, where we're going to retire, where we're going to start a business or invest. 95%. And that brings us to the next shift. When we use the internet, we're not typing in Ashland. I, in this case, I typed in, uh, what did I type in here? Uh, let's see, Italian restaurants, Bowling Green. So I did this for the Kentucky League of Cities because remember, remember, I'm not from Ashland. But how somebody might use the internet, they would type in Italian restaurants in Bowling Green if they happen to be going there. Or they would type in best schools in Kentucky. Where do you show up? Or they would type in top places to live in central Kentucky or eastern Kentucky. Or they will type in top biking trails. Or they will top in, you know, what's top arts towns and probably Paducah and Berea are going to come up. I mean, they'll type in job opportunities in Bowling Green or Ashland or new housing developments in Hopkinsville. But you notice something about this? The city was never the first thing they typed in. So if we type in country music in, in Kentucky, do you show up? See what I mean? What do you want to be known for? Because they're not typing in the city first. They're typing in wh what they want. If somebody says, I'm an avid mountain biker, they will type in mountain biking places in Kentucky or Eastern Kentucky, and then they'll say, oh, I gotta go check out Ashland. So location is always second to your primary draw, that one thing that puts you on the map. And so to win, you must quit marketing geography first. It's what do you wanna be known for? You know, in this state, Berea, of course, is known for artists in action. Lexington is known for horses. Bardstown is the bourbon capital. There's probably about 50 of those. You know, Paducah, Crafts, they're about folk art. Louisville calls itself Bourbon City. I mean, they're known for many other things. Um, Bowling Green, Corvettes, uh, London, you know, London, Kentucky is where Colonel Sanders is from. Stanton, Red River, Gorge, Loretto, Maker's Mark. What about Ashland? And so what sets you apart from everyone else? What sets Ashland apart from the other 421 communities in this state, let alone the two states right next to you? So the burning question is this, and this is the very first thing this destination team has to do is, what do we have in Ashland that the people we're hoping to track can't get or do closer to home? As visitors, or as a place to invest in, or a place to live in? You have two choices. You could be either different or clearly better. But if you want to be better at something, it's because third party says it's better, not you. And so in this, back in this video library, we have this finding your unique selling proposition. Um, you put together your team. The first thing you do is what do we want to be known for? 
And then there's videos on branding. So this is going to be the resource center for your team where they can learn how to do this. And we're going to start some of this this afternoon. I mean, we're here this week to do really intensive stuff. And so we even did branding success stories. But this is the big question. What sets you apart from everyone else? And you know what? The mayor and your commissioners cannot make this decision. They were elected to be all things to all people. Your brand can't be. You have to find your niche and promote it like crazy. As a matter of fact, if you want to do this brand, finding your unique selling proposition is really branding. I try not to use the word branding because people think that's about getting a new logo. Have you ever gone in there because they had a great logo? Or you said, I'm not going there because I think their logo sucks. That doesn't matter. And by the way, if you want to do this as a public project, here's how it typically goes. Mayor, you'll like this. Number one, there's enthusiasm. Oh, that Brooks guy came into town. We're really pumped about really putting Ashland on the map. And then we start doing all the planning. And then there's disillusionment as we narrow the focus down to one thing. Then there's fear and panic, search for the guilty, punishment of the innocent, and finally, praise and honors for the non-participants. I get that about right? Yeah. So... You know, when we talk about putting together this team, they represent the private sector. If you think Delta represents the private sector, Economic Development represents the private sector. The Paramount is probably nonprofit. That's fine. Build Ashland probably represents the private sector. Your educational is public sector. Ashland Alliance, private sector. Ashland Motion, private sector. You know, your, your young professional, private sector. Major employer, private sector. It could be the hospital, whoever. But See what I mean? We want them to take the lead in this. And so, you know, I was sitting here over the last couple of days trying to think, you know, is your brand music? I mean, I, I went on Wikipedia, and, and of course, everything, you know, Billy Ray right there that you see, I mean, Trey Cyrus, you know, Mark Fossen, Mabel Height, I mean, some of these go way back, Naomi, Wyona, you know, Julie Reeves, these are all people that are from here. You know, I mean, all of these people are here, and I kept going. And then you have this country music highway. I'm not so sure about that, but where you, you have this Highway 23 called the Country Music Highway. Where is it? Where's the country music? Why is it even called that? Maybe somebody should claim it and own it. Or maybe it's the Bluegrass Highway. I don't know. You're the Bluegrass State. So I kept going, why, why? you need to be known some. Could it be music? Could it be country music, bluegrass? Could it be music performing arts? Could it be metal sculptures? You're a, you're a metal town and people come here and learn how the art of sculpting. Something. Could it be Appalachia? You know, the music, the food. And by the way, I know a lot of people think, oh, Appalachia, that means blue tarps and banjo music. Not necessarily. People from outside the area, I mean, even in Asheville, you know, that's the, um, the, the highway there. I mean, they're all, all about Appalachia. But whatever, you need to find something. And you're never going to do this by public consent because they're going to say, we have something for everyone. Have you ever gone anywhere because they had something for everyone? We don't. We go, there's something for us. I mean, even right downstairs is the guitar bar. And it seems like, and, and then, by the way, we were at the Highlands Museum. Look at this. Blue Crash Bash coming up, by the way, everybody, November 16th. It's already here. Maybe you just need to hang your hat on it. I mean, I'm not trying to tell you that music should be your brand, but I'm going, it's kind of your foundation. And granted, Billy Ray is still around. I mean, you know, uh, Wynonna is still, I mean, you've got a, a lot of people here. There's no reason why you can't be bringing up more. So whatever it is, you need to find something. And that's this team. Then what this team does says, well, you know what? Don't go to city council and they say city or the city commission. You go to the commissioners and say, we, the brand development team, or Des Destination Ashland, we want to go down the path of music, antiques, whatever it is, and say, city, well, you'll help us where it's appropriate. Do not put them in the position where they have to vote on whether they like this brand. Because somebody's going to say, well, you know, this county is really well known for off-road vehicles. That should be our brand. Somebody else say, yeah, but we're a horseback riding place. I mean, you're never going to get public consensus. So let this team do it, and the city will say, if that's the way you want to go, you represent the private sector, you represent these organizations, 
We're there for you. What can we do to help? Don't put them in that position. Does this make sense? And so, whatever. If you're, and by the way, you need to do this first. Because when you decide, I always say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then we'll make it look like that. If you want to be about kids and family, where do we put the carousel? Where do we put the downtown splash pad? See what I mean? Where do we get the retailers and restaurants that cater to kids and family? If you want to be about nightlife, where do we go and recruit and bring in the microbrews? Or the wineries? You know, where do we put the street musicians? That's what you have to do. So find your unique selling proposition. Put together your team, find the unique selling proposition. Then number three, you need to develop an action plan. We're going to do a lot of that this week. This is not something where you need to go out and hire a bunch of consultants and they come in and a year later, you finally have a plan that somebody from the outside did. Even when we work with communities, I always say, we're not going to give you a plan. We're going to help facilitate the process because that has to come from you. I can never come in here and say, Ashlyn, I think your brand should be music, and then go home and you're going, yeah, that outsider told us that should be our brand. It needs to come from you. I mean, to me, that was kind of a like, well, duh. But you may say, no, that, that, we're past that. We're something else now. So, and we even have videos on that. So this is just little teasers for your team when they get going all about developing an action plan. We are not proponents of strategic plans, sorry. Strategic plans are so yesterday. And how many do you have sitting on shelves gathering dust? Branding. What is it we want to be known for? What do we have to do to own it? And marketing, how do we tell the world action plan, the to-do list? Branding, development, marketing, action plan. Should never be more than 100 pages. It's a to-do list, not some big 300-page document with a whole bunch of crap in the back. And so, by the way, with your local organizations, once you have your brand focus, you as the city say, okay, we're going to give you, we have some money, grants, whatever, that we're going to give to local organizations. You say, if you are going to help push our brand forward, whether it's music, whether it's antiques, whether it's kids and family, whatever it is, if you're on board with this, that's how we'll help fund you. This way you help get people on the same page, pulling in the same direction. And number four, so you start with a plan, and you can do a plan. We're going to, you know what? Friday morning, we're already working with your team. Friday morning, we're going to say, here's your plan. Here's a three-year plan. This does not need to take six months to do. And so, priority number four is make downtown the top priority. And here's a big shift. According to all these magazines and publications, Money Sense, Great Canadian Van Lines, Wallet Hub, Niche.com, Livability.com, Money Magazine, USA Today, Forbes, all these people went out and asked people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, so millennials and some Gen Xers. They asked them, what are your top priorities when picking a place to live? What are your top priorities? And here's the top 10 in order. Number one is they wanted safety, particularly for kids. That was number one. They want to feel safe. Number two, they want a good educational system and child care. And by the way, kids, the, the millennials are having their kids later in life. Boomers are having their kids in their 20s. Millennials are having their kids in their late 30s, even early 40s. Fathers are spending twice as much time with their kids as us boomers did. So that's number two, is we, they're thinking about families. Even if they're not married yet, this is what they're thinking about. Number three was an engaged community, a sense of belonging downtown. Number three on the list. Because you know what happens in places, a lot of them, and I don't know if it's the same in Ashland, we are usually tied to our neighborhood and the schools, but not the city. You know, I was actually pretty impressed. I thought, well, we're going to get 40 people here today, and we probably got twice that many here in this room right now. That's pretty awesome. That means you do care. But this is number three for them, engaged community. And when I put, by the way, when I go back to that and talk about a sense of belonging, that they're at the table, that we have a role to play. And then number four, cultural depth. They want some cultural depth, like street musicians, um, 
uh, concerts in the park, um, you know, little things like the bluegrass bash or other things. I mean, anything you do that adds some cultural depth. Performing arts, education, food, all of those things. And that's downtown. And then number five, life after six o'clock, Ashland. <laughs> and you're not alone, by the way. And that, three of the top ten are about downtowns. And then we go to top-notch recreation, surpassing other areas, which I think you've got in spades. I mean, you know, as I drove down from Columbus, it's, you know, a lot of the Midwest and in the East is flat, and the closer I got, the more hilly it got, and I mean, it just, the train just switched and everything. I went, oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. And when we talk about recreation, we're talking about local trails. We're talking about your sports facilities. We're talking about all of these types of things. And so... Number seven on that list is health. Notice, particularly for kids. I think health, you got you. I mean, you're the health center for the whole region, aren't you? You know, from what I've heard, and what I've read. And then number eight is transportation. It doesn't mean you have to have a bus system. I think you actually do have transit. But bike lanes, ride share, schools, I mean, all these things. You need to have downtown, there should be there should be bike racks for people are riding bikes. And then you say, well, yeah, but we're really hilly. No bikes. You're wrong. People want out of their cars. And then number nine is affordability and quality. I mean, they want, can we get starter homes, move-ups, nice neighborhoods? Uh, for boomers, can we downsize? And by the way, who's moving into downtowns? Boomers, not millennials. Empty nesters. They don't want the yard and the upkeep. And then number 10 is, look at this. Jobs is number 10. Because if you're a place that people want to live, they will find a job or they will create one. That's what's different. Number 10, and that's a major shift. So here's another shift. Downtown is the litmus test for anybody that is going to invest in your community. Site selectors, I mean, uh, uh, venture capitalists, They'll come into your downtown, and the health of your downtown economically is how they judge the health of your community, fair or not. I used to do site selection work. And downtowns are your very best recruitment tool. And they create a sense of community. It's your third place. The first place is the place, it's your nucleus. The first place is the place we live, it's our home. The second place is the place we work. And the third place is the place we go to hang out. That's downtown Asheville, North Carolina. I mean, Starbucks built an entire brand out of creating a third place. You can go there, spend 10 bucks on a cup of coffee. Okay, I'm exaggerating by a dollar. But you can go there and hang out all day. And by the way, downtowns and tourism reduce the tax burden on local residents. So the more you go in downtown, the more those property values increase, and that takes, less, that takes more of the burden off the residential community. Your downtown commercial development should be carrying 35% of your tax base. I'll bet you it's carrying 10%. See what I mean? And that's typical of rural America. By the way, any money you invest in your downtown is an investment, not an expense. As a matter of fact, last year, Governor Doug Burgum in North Dakota called me his new best friend. He had the largest, in North Dakota has 90,000 six-figure jobs available. And they can't get people to move to North Dakota because of their perceptions of it or whatever. So he held the largest downtown Main Street conference in the country last year. They had 650 people there from all over North Dakota, because placemaking is his number one priority. So downtowns are very important. And number five, they are about placemaking. And you might go, what the heck is this whole placemaking thing? I mean, another one of these words. And here it is. It's a multifaceted approach to the planning, design, programming, and management of public spaces. Crap, it'll be OK. We can keep going on and on. But here's placemaking. It's planning. 
What's the focus? What's it feel like? Is it kids and family? If it's music, can we have that stage with the lighting and the sound system? I mean, whatever it is, what's your focus? Design, what does it look like now that we know what we are? I mean, even if you go downstairs, they got the guitar bar, but then the window, they got like a big rack, a picture, a big rack of amplifiers and everything. And they theme that little restaurant around it. Same type of thing. What's the focus? What's it look like? And then what happens there? And I'm going to get into this programming. And then who may, takes care of it and funds it? And then what's included? Furnitures, fixtures, and it's all included. So placemaking ingredients include public gatherings, wide sidewalks, plazas, year-round public markets. I mean, programming, seating areas, things to do, activities, not events, shops, eateries, sidewalk cafes, I mean, extensive beautification, street trees, planners. This is all part of placemaking, cultural depth, street vendors, musicians, artisans. I mean, it has to be about people, pedestrian friendly, safe, and well lit. And most of it's after 6 o'clock p.m. I have to tell you, when I got here Monday, I was out on 52, and there was a line of cars up on, the, up on the freeway, or the highway, waiting to take the exit to turn into Ashland. So I got in line, I turned right, went over the bridge, came into Ashland, turned left to come to this hotel. At 5.30, streets were all rolled up. And so, you know, those are probably people that are coming back from work. And so I thought, man, if we could take Winchester from 13th to 18th and really focus on that, because I always say start with one, two, three, four blocks and really make it cool, and then 16th Street where Judd Plaza is, and maybe we could eventually make that tight. You got the waterfront park up there. I thought, man, if we had this pedestrian core, I mean, granted, I would love to see you narrow down Winchester. I mean, we're going to get into these kinds of topics. Number six, downtowns are about people, not cars. Here's a big shift. The number, one of the very top priorities in downtowns is we want a pedestrian-friendly experience. Think about this. Only 70% of millennials even have a driver's license, and the average age is 24. My gosh, when I was 16, that day I was down there getting my driver's license. I have a daughter who's 31 years old who does not have a driver's license. She goes, why would I get one? Number one, the expense of a car. When, and what you're doing is you're, they, they, they want to be out of their cars. And granted, you're in a rural area where if you don't have a car, it's tough to get anywhere. But this is a big shift. You're forcing them to go into the urban areas. We are moving to the European standard across America. And that's why you hear all in the politics about socialism. I mean, we're moving that way, but I'm not going to get into that topic. What I'm going to get into is the, the feeling of pedestrian-friendly, intimate settings. These towns were created 500 years ago, before there was the automobile. And you know what? They're still some of the biggest draws in the world throughout Western Europe, even South America. We want out of our cars in a pedestrian setting. This is Belfast, Ireland. Belfast was one of the bees you avoided. Belfast, Beirut, Baghdad, right? <laughs> Guess what? They closed down nearly 100 miles of vehicular streets. It is now the youngest city in the world. Apple is there, Facebook is there, Google is there, all the tech companies are in Belfast because the young people are there and they want the pedestrian experience. You walk and bike everywhere. And by the way, their weather is not that easy to deal with. They get the wind, they get the rain, they don't care. I mean, this is, we were involved with this one. This is the third street promenade in Santa Monica. Santa Monica was known for the Santa Monica Pier. Third street was full of drug needles and the dilapidated buildings. So we went in to help create Third Street Promenade, which we reorchestrated the business mix on Third Street, and now it's closed off to cars, and it's where all of Southern California hangs out, even though Santa Monica is a population of 70,000. New York City closed down 60 miles. It was the most congested city in America. They closed down 60 miles of lanes of traffic in downtown New York City, and they did it by putting up temporary, this used to be a taxi lane. 
They use green paint and planters. They closed down 60 of these corners. That used to be a right turn lane. They created 60 corner plazas. This was another traffic lane right in the middle there. That is now all pedestrian and biking. With these little, look at these little plaza areas with high top tables and stuff. And guess what? New York City is now the ninth most congested city in America. Because people are just saying, forget it, I'm going to park over in in uh, Jersey City and take the path over to New York and I don't need a car in Manhattan. I mean, you know, go to the High Line Trail there. I mean, you know, I mean, just everything, cities are doing this and there's no reason small cities can't do it either. This used to be a big boulevard through downtown Boulder, Colorado. Now pedestrian thoroughfare. And it's full of music, it's full of art. Everywhere you go, McKinney, Texas, they still have driving, but they have like 20 foot wide sidewalks. Revelstoke, British Columbia, even small towns are doing this. I mean, this is Newport on the Levee. Lifestyle retail centers get it. That's what Newport on the Levee is. And they make it all about the pedestrian experience and it works. I mean, this is downtown New Orleans. I mean, look at this, narrow streets, wider sidewalks. And so I thought, man, if it was up to me, I would go on those five blocks and I would narrow it down to two lanes and I would make it a priority. What's really great is I do this in towns where you don't have another, you have two thoroughfares on both sides of Winchester that are already main thoroughfares. Most towns, I would say, do it anyway. And so you might say, well, Winchester would get, you know, everybody, you have to go on Winchester to go across a bridge. I get it. But you know what? The best friend for any downtown is congestion. If you're trying to route people through downtown faster, your downtown is never going to succeed. We don't even know what you have. It's changing everything. I would create, you know what I would do? i create angle in parking. I, and, and here's why. Number one, if you narrow the street down two lanes, you'll get a third more parking places. And by the way, think about this. How many of you, when you go into town, go, oh, good, parallel parking? <laughs> we don't. I mean, that's why auto, auto manufacturers now are teaching cars how to parallel park themselves. <laughs> think about it. If you, you know, think about this. Women account for 80% of all consumer spending. I'm going to get more on that, so you, no comments yet. But imagine anybody coming in downtown and going, oh, that's such a cute shop, parallel parking, is it worth the hassle? But angle and parking, you just go, oh, quick, pull in. And by the way, people say, yeah, but angle and parking can be more dangerous. What do you mean? Cars for 100 years, or almost 100 years, have had reverse lights. <laughs> Actually, parallel parking is the best traffic calming you could ever have. You'll get a third more spaces. That opens up more areas to create plazas and pedestrian areas. I mean, I would add even more street. I would have street trees every 30 to 35 feet up and down Winchester. You know what? I would reorganize some of your business mix. You got kind of low-end businesses. You got so many service businesses that have no reason to stay open after five. You know, so those are the things I would, I would probably make a priority. And then... Another shift is, here's what's coming into downtown. By the way, we are moving from Macy's to Etsy-style shops. 50% of all American households pay the $100 plus a year to be Amazon Prime members. 50%. That's to pay. So you know what? The days of going downtown for shopping, we're about Etsy. We don't do Etsy on, on Amazon. That stuff you have to, it's an impulse buy or stuff you have to see and feel in person. You know what's coming into downtowns? And this is honest to God true. The butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. <laughs> These shops are thriving in downtowns. Shoe stores are actually coming back, even with Zappos out there, which is owned by Amazon. Even they are coming back into downtowns. And so I saw that there at, you know, is it the Mayo Arcade, the Cameo Arcade, CA Mayo Arcade, the arcade is full of this. Now, it has some challenges 
because we walked through there yesterday and about a quarter of them are empty and a third of them are closed even when they say they're supposed to be open. And so I went, this is a failure happening and I feel sorry for the businesses that are open because we're the only ones in there because I think for most people say we never know if the business is going to be open or not so we don't go in there. But these are the kinds of shops that can really make it downtown. This has tremendous potential if there was some enforcement of hours and if it had better curb appeal. When I walk by it on the street, there's nothing that would get me to walk in there. It has no curb appeal. So here's what gets me in trouble. You can tell i kind of black and white about things. I mean, I'm telling you, just as a visitor, it had no curb appeal. In an arcade, I thought it was going to be machines, pinball machines and stuff. I mean, nobody's used the word arcade for shopping in 50 years. So, but anyway, these are the kind of shops that people love that will pull them downtown. If they're open on consistent hours, and if it had better curb appeal, and if we knew that this was full of Etsy-style shops. Because they're great, the ones that are in there. Really great. And then the next shift is the boomers are the ones moving into downtown. It's already touched on it. But you know, I got to tell you that this is coming to you in the next five years. Yeah. So, number seven, downtowns are about life after six o'clock. As a matter of fact, downtown is where we go after work on weekends. You know, this is something you need to know. Is that first of all, the boomers and the Gen Xers have their kids in their late 30s, early 40s. They're better parents because of it. Fathers spend twice as much time. And 72% of the time, both parents work. That's twice the number from the 1960s, even the early 70s, twice. So the number one priority is convenience. That's the grocery deliveries, Amazon Fresh, all of this stuff, meal kit deliveries, you name it. And by the way, in the United States, the average time for dinner in the 50s, 60s, even the early 70s, was 5.30. Today, it's 7.30. In Western Europe, it's 9 o'clock. We're moving that way. Yet, I've been in many towns. I haven't tested yours yet, where restaurants close at 8. And your retail's close. I mean, so what happens is, this is the big statistic. 70% of all consumer retail bricks and mortar spending takes place after 6 p.m. 70%. Are you open? You're making us go to Walmart, CVS. That was the National Retail Federation did that. Who belongs there? Walmart, McDonald's, I mean Subway, CVS, Walgreens, grocery store, Safeway, you name it. They all are open 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, midnight, 24 hours a day, duh, and your downtown doesn't seem to get it. Your merchants don't get it. I get it. It's a small family. We have to go home, cook dinner for the kids. But you know what? You can do it. There's even a video we created, How to Stay Open After 6 o'clock. And by the way, I would start on Fridays and Saturdays because right now, if you want younger families and stuff, they come here. They, what do they do? They come home after work? There's no place for them to go. They could go to a restaurant or something, I guess, and then just go home. But what are they going to do? You're going to have these beautiful, beautiful statues coming into town. People are going to come into town. Wouldn't it be great if they're coming into town? And then they come up. We, we create that connection to Winchester. They come down Winchester. And where they go in the arcade, half the businesses are closed in the middle of the day. Or where they go downtown and there's... You know, businesses are open or closed, and they're here for the... You know what? By the way, people spend the night where there's things to do after 6 o'clock. This hotel could be an incredible place for conventions and meetings and all of those things. But people aren't going to come here if what they do is at the end of the day, they're back in their hotel room watching TV because the, the town is closed. So even this can't really succeed until you give them a downtown that's more vibrant. And by the way, your downtown should be your community living room. The number one priority of all Americans is decompressing in a pedestrian-friendly setting. Number one priority. So, placemaking is improving the quality of life for your citizens by creating a community living room. It's where you hang out. 
It says nothing to do with tourism. So if you think of it as your community living room, think about your house. Think about what would be nice to own that one. But here, when you think about when people come and visit you, you might have popcorn. You might watch movies. Wouldn't it be great if you had a plaza where you did movies on the square? See what I mean? Every Monday night during the summer months. I mean, we might come over to your house and we'll play, you know, games like Jenga blocks right there or table games. Why can't you do that downtown? I'm going to show you. Wouldn't it be great if people were there having birthdays and celebrations came downtown to do it? You know, instead of McDonald's or wherever they're going. Wouldn't it be great if you had celebrations downtown? You had the taste of Asheville, the taste of Eastern Kentucky, whatever you want to call it, the taste of bluegrass country, I mean, whatever. Wouldn't it be great if you had tailgate parties for college games, pro sports games? Wouldn't it be great if you even brought down the bouncy houses? You can rent them, have vendors bring them in, and invite your families downtown into your community living room. Wouldn't it be great when this time of year you had this little plaza where you put out the fire pits with propane tanks and people come and hang out? Wouldn't it be great if you had businesses that actually put benches out in front? You know, you wonder why we do this in the front porches? It makes your home feel welcoming. I didn't see one single bench in your downtown. All of these, this is musical instruments in Caldwell, Idaho. They just put out there so people would come play them. You know, you have to shift focus because it's outdoors versus your living room, but that's fine. Let me show you some examples. But this is in a place called White Ave in Old Stack Corner. This is in Edmonton, Alberta. It's a neighborhood, White Ave. And their whole focus is celebrating good things in life. This is where Edmonton comes to celebrate. And they've got the narrower street. They've got the wider sidewalks. They've got all kinds of sidewalk cafes, even in the winter in Edmonton, Alberta. Ask your neighbors, what would get you to go downtown once or twice a month? I mean, wouldn't that, just ask them. You know, if you can get once every, if you can get 200 people to come down downtown after work or weekend, you know, 1% of your population, that would be great. Now, the businesses have to be open, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. But wouldn't it be great to have more of these? And granted, I'm here in November, so maybe you do have sidewalk cafes during the summer. I hope your downtown looks like this in the summer months. Or like this in Portland, Oregon, the bungalow bar, with a fire pit right there in the middle. We've even seen cities take parking spaces. This right here is like six parking spaces. And they put up these little planters and they put up these big chess sets. See that big chess set right there? You can buy those for $700. You could have a local bank or somebody sponsor like six of them. Wouldn't it be great if you had music? This is in Nelson, British Columbia, which is in the Kootenay Rocky Mountains. And they have entertainers out there 360 days of the year. And they're working for tips. I mean, Asheville, North Carolina. Once again, you'll see in Greenville, South Carolina, for you that, that go there, but wouldn't it be great if you had this in your downtown in a space, like Judd Plaza? Wouldn't it be great if you did this and people would just go grab lunch or ice cream, or even if you had food trucks, anything to get people downtown? This is Judd Plaza, the design for it, narrowing the street. You know, I just think, and all this is pretty flat, there's some water features. But the trick is, this is a beautiful space that's going to happen in front of the bank. I think eventually it'd be really cool if it started, this whole area became, I think it'd be really great if all of 16th Street became, over time, a pedestrian plaza. But even in this space, the whole trick, this beautiful space, you've got to program it. I've seen too many plazas that are a downtown park and nothing goes on there. It must be programming. And that takes us to the next thing. The key ingredient is programming. This is Main Street Square in Rapid City, South Dakota. This hotel right here is called the Alex Johnson. And the, only the first floors were open and the rest was all closed. And it was just dilapidated. They created Main Street Square here, which, by the way, was a 65 space parking lot. They did not make up the parking. They turned it into a plaza. And you can see the water feature going there. It changed everything. That hotel is now fully refurbished. Millions and tens of millions of dollars went into it. 
They had 40% vacancy in the downtown. There's no vacancies. And they created a pretty amazing destination. You need, here's the thing. I want you to get out of the event business and get into the activity business. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do your events that you have, but here's your deal. If you are spending your time doing events downtown, and yesterday I tried to figure out how many events you have in downtown in a year, and let's say it's 20 days. That's pushing it in Ashland. 20 days events downtown is not enough to sustain one single retailer. Not one. If you want, so here's what happens in downtown. What comes first is people hanging out downtown 250 days or more, then retailers will come back. Where people hang out, retailers follow. Way back in the 50s when we all started moving out in the suburbs, guess what? The retail went out in the suburbs. Penny's, Woolworth, Sears, all those stores went out in the suburbs into suburban malls. The days of suburban malls are over. They're dying. A third of them will close this year. Some of them are still doing okay. The one you have is doing okay. But most of them are dying because people want downtowns. And so if you can create people, create a reason for people to come downtown 250 days a year, you'll have no retail vacancies and your landlords will get more per square foot and the merchants will be more than willing to pay it because you're bringing people to their front door 250 days a year. So I say, we spend too much time on events and not enough time on activities. So there it is. Bringing people downtown will put customers in front of their stores. And then don't compete with your retailers. Here's one problem. You have Central Park, right? Beautiful park. And, and I want it to stay. I want it to be a fantastic park. It's a really great asset. But if you host most of your events at Central Park, then it's competing with downtown. See what I mean? And by the way, if you ever close off Winchester Street and you do markets, public markets or shows, all your tents should be in the middle of the street. You never put those little booths up against the sidewalk. You're blocking off your retailers. They should always be back to back in the middle of the street. So we have the retail here, the, the booths here, then another set of booths here, and then a walking space, and then next set of retailers. And so those are things you can do. Right now, you don't have really the retail mix you need to make downtown a place to hang out. Most of your businesses are service businesses that close at 5 and there's no incentive to stay open. But that we'll talk about that. So people downtown on a consistent basis. There you go. Could we do that? And could we do that for a year? And then add a Thursday night. I mean, you need to concentrate, then add Thursday, then add Sunday afternoon, you know, then add Wednesday, then Tuesday, and over time, get open after work. That Jed Plaza, when it gets redone, it's, it should be active from 11 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night, but the key hours are 4 to 11, or 4 to 9 at night. Key hours, after work and on weekends. If you can get people downtown, after work on weekends, consistently, now there's incentive for the businesses to be open. And for businesses that complain that, what are you doing for me lately? What are you doing for yourself? You all work or you're going to school. When you get off work, they're closed. Duh! You know, this is why in Europe, South America, and everything, they have siestas, where they'll open at 10 in the morning. You'd be better opening at 11 and staying open until 8 o'clock at night. But they have CSs where they actually close for two hours in the middle of the afternoon, and then they're open later. I mean, there's, there are all kinds of ways to do it, but you need to program it. I'll give you another. This is a town called Waterloo in Ontario. There's a shopper's drugs mark, a bank there. There's kind of a mall back there. We went in and said, I want you to get rid of all this parking. We do have parking right over here. We want you to get rid of all that parking. You don't need to make it up. I don't want you to turn it into a plaza. <gasps> Here's the argument. You take away the parking, you're going to kill my business. Wrong. I got more than that. So that went from that to that. They did it temporarily. It never went back to parking. So they created these events. You can see vendors right there. They did the little stairs there. There it is with a concert going on in this corner stage. 
I mean, they always have stuff going on there. Here it is at night, and you know, this is, uh, we got this picture uh, one night when they just turn on the lights before the activities. But even in the summer, two days a week, they have yoga in the mornings on the square. How cool is this? And during the winter, guess what? It's an ice rink. You know, this is Main Street Square in Rapid City. There it is in the summer. I mean, look at that place. It's packed. This, by the way, was an empty Sears building. And I said, I want you to tear down the Sears building. Pigeons were living in it. I said, tear down the Sears building. Here it is right here. And I said, just make a two-acre plaza. But this is 65 parking space, not an acre. And by the way, there's a parking garage back there. But you know what? Right on the ground level is public restrooms, visitor information. It's where they park a Zamboni. You can guess they have ice. It's where they put stuff. So it's not like they made it up with a parking garage. But I said, buy this, tear down, buy the Sears building, tear it down, make a two-acre plaza. I get a phone call from the guy. He says, Roger, this is Ray Hillebrand, and I own a lot of properties in downtown Rapid City. And by the way, we're not taking down that Sears building because I just bought it. And I gave the city $2 million to build a plaza next to my new building. Guess what? Rents in downtown Rapid City went from about $12 a square foot per year. He's getting nearly $50 a square foot with a waiting list. It was a smart investment. That has six restaurants in it now. I mean, this is it before, and this is it after. This is a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And all of a sudden, car shows started coming in, quilt shows started coming in. People started hosting, the outside of it started being hosted in their town. I mean, that Sears building is phenomenal now. They do this, there's a beer garden for this because this big car show came into town. I mean, it changed everything. And so we went into 100 cities that get rid of parking and didn't make it up, and people screamed like crazy, and in the end, retail sales and everything skyrocketed. By the way, that splash pad runs 120 days a year. You can shut it off. It's flush-mounted fountains. You can put tables and chairs on it. I mean, this is it during the summer months. That's 120 days a year there. There's a stage. You can see it. There's a band up on the stage right there. This is during the middle of the day, during the middle of the week. And this is it in the winter. 120 days ice, 120 days of summer. There's 240 of your 250 days. Activities, not events. By the way, that is a little bigger than Rockefeller Center's ice rink. That's 8,000 square feet. They make $250,000 a year just renting ice skates and have to dole them out because it gets too crowded. I mean, you'd have people say, I, I want to move to Ashland instantly if you had this. I mean, this is happening across America. Then at 9 o'clock every night, the, the, the lights are all LED and the water goes to a higher pressure. So kids aren't running out there this time of day. They're going out there and they do this music and light show. And people just come and hang out. And the restaurants are open until 10 o'clock. I love what somebody wrote. This is movies on the square every Monday night. The average attendance is 3,500. And you know what? Movie night, Main Street Square, Rapid City, it says, I grew up in Rapid City. It was never as cool as it is now. Within 24 months of them building Main Street Square, the average age of a person buying a home dropped 12 years. Families were coming back. I mean, Valparaiso, Indiana, Central Park Plaza, right in their downtown. Uh, here we go. This is Indian Creek Plaza in, in Caldwell, Idaho, which is now open. As a matter of fact, they have an ice ribbon that goes around it. And last year, this last winter, they made $300,000 renting ice skates. I mean, this is up on that white avenue I was telling you about. Splash pad, you can shut them off. You've got the stage there. I mean, this is Topeka, Kansas. This is under construction right now. It's, it's happening everywhere. Now, granted, these are bigger cities than you, but we've seen it happen in Kelowna, British Columbia, and small towns just as well. It doesn't have to be as big as these, maybe, but that's how, create, 
how big, great it can be. This is in Michigan City, Indiana. In Michigan City, Indiana, the city bought three buildings downtown that were dilapidated and tore them out to build the plaza. And they closed the street. You know, this is what it was. They, they bought this building, this building, this building, and they're closing this off. That building there, he's going to put two restaurants that face onto it. He donated this to the city to build the plaza. This is closed. All this is going to be plaza. And it's going to be pretty cool. And by the way, I'm not going to get all the little numbers here, but this changed everything, and it's going to look like that. They're already it's under construction. So, number 10. Tourism, downtown is tourism's very best friend. You know what, the number one reason people travel visit friends and family. When friends and family visit you, where do you take them? You do take them downtown. And where do you take them downtown? To eat. To eat. See, so that's, that's exactly what we want to do. It's exactly. Because it's funny, because when Cincinnati gets home from work, they come over to Kentucky. Because Covington has done a pretty good job, and so has Newport on the levee right there. Uh, you know? But look at this. Front tour, tourism is the front door to your non-tourism economic development. I already mentioned this. I'll just go through these. But all these people, they come here first as what? A visitor. Is this a place their client would want to live? Their employees would want to live? I mean, plus with tourism, people come, they spend money and go home. We like that. And if you're bringing the right kind of visitors, you don't have to police them. You don't need the social services for them. I mean, that's the great thing about tourism. It's all about this. This is the number one activity. We might come here for music. We might come here for the, the, the Highlands uh, Museum. We might come here for the uh, shows at the Paramount. But the number one activity once we arrive is shopping, dining, and entertainment in a pedestrian-friendly, intimate setting. And guess what? That is where 80% of the non-lodging spending takes place, and I don't think you're getting much of that 80%. That's the missing ingredient. You know, I used to teach for Disney Institute. This is why they built downtown Disney outside each of its parks, to get that 80%. That's the importance of downtown. And then, of course, if you don't hang out in downtown, Neither will visitors, they go where you go. That's why this is about community first. And then, women account for 80% of all consumer spending. I'm waiting. There you go, there's the comment I always get. That's all? It's absolutely true. And by the way, that is not a shift. But I was working at Wickford, Rhode Island, and this picture was not staged. What do you see? <laughs> Guys are going, been there, done that. Think benches. I think all along Winchester, in front of every single business, there should be a bench, and it should be, that's my wife, she was like, okay. Um, <laughs> they should always be flanked with pots. Planners, and they don't all have to be cookie cutter the same. Every business should have their own, but it makes your business. They should always be at the facade facing out because right now you have a downtown that when you look at it, all you see is concrete and hard surface. You really don't have a downtown. You have beautiful, beautiful, stunning architecture. You have an amazing downtown, but right now it has very little curb appeal. Businesses have way too many posters in their windows. And by the way, for some of you, uh, I think, I can't remember, was the Paramount or the museum? So one of them, have, when they have more than four posters in a window, people ignore them all. Studies have proved that. So if somebody asks you to hang up a poster, okay, which one do you want me to take down? But when we talk about women and shopping and all of that, there's their priorities. They want to feel safe, they want well lit, they want it full of life, and they want people there. So, another shift. There's nothing you can invest in besides schools that will have a faster, better return investment than your downtown. All you need is, if you could do three blocks of Winchester, you'd have it. Narrow the street, do angle in parking, 
um, you know, do more curbside beautification. As a matter of fact, one of the things I'm going to suggest to the team is you should have a business improvement district. You know, the city right now will give some money to there, but I think that the businesses need to have some skin in the game to beautify the storefronts. I always say cities should be charged with curbside beautification. Downtown merchants should be charged with facade side beautification. It needs to be a public-private partnership. But there's nothing you can invest in. I mean, this is in El Dorado. Oh, no, no, that one's in Edmonton, Alberta. But El Dorado, Arkansas, a town of your side, is a phenomenal job as well. And so there's all kinds of videos to help you through this whole process. So in the end, I mean, we got the quick, it was a quick tour of the Highlands Museum. It's incredible. The work, the work they're doing over there is amazing in there. I mean, we got to see all, was it five floors? We got to see five floors. I mean, it's the things that, that she's doing in there. And there were volunteers yesterday putting, decorating Christmas trees. I mean, that place is phenomenal. You know, it, does, it doesn't have real super strong curb appeal because, once again, nobody in downtown has any facade side beautification. And so, but anyway, it's just, I mean, you've got, you've got all the ingredients. I mean, the Paramount, what can I say? It's just absolutely gorgeous. And both of these are worthy of any size city anywhere. And you have them in a town of 20,000 in rural Kentucky. You know, even what EB, what you're doing over there is phenomenal. I mean, I kept going, and he mentioned this, and I went, oh, my gosh. I walked in that place, I think, man, I keep thinking a year-round public market. I keep thinking a huge, incredible mercantile. And I think, EB, you even mentioned this, you know, Mass to General. If you've ever been in these stores, they got one in Asheville. Um, this one is in Knoxville, Tennessee. These are incredible stores that are draw all into themselves. And what he's doing there is amazing. I mean, I kept, we walked up in some upper floors and I'm going, man, I want a condo right here overlooking the street. And he's going, that's my office. But, but I mean, just phenomenal. Can you imagine if you had the, you have the Paramount, you have what you're going to do there, you have uh, the Highlands Museum, you've got this hotel, you've got, when you do that, you'll have the retail anchor tenant that right now is missing. You'll have all the pieces. Now what you need to do is make it more pedestrian friendly. You need to make it about people, not cars. And so finally, in closing, some of the best words of wisdom can be found in downtown. I love taking pictures of signs. And so I love this one here. If you have to choose between drinking wine every day or being skinny, which would you choose, red or white? <laughs> It's <laughs> red. My wife said red. Alcohol may not solve your problems, but neither will water or milk. A lot of these are booze related for some reason. This one hit, hit kind of home for me. You know, don't forget to buy a bottle for mom. Remember, you're the reason she drinks. <laughs> and finally, you know, here you go. Here's this one. Carrots may be good for your eyes, but booze will double your vision. And then I'll let you read that one. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That was like, oh, wow. And then this was in front of a cupcake shop. <laughs> and this one hit pretty close to home also. Yep. And then I can relate to this one. Pilates? I thought you said pie and lattes. <laughs> I saw this in a town up in Canada. It says, push, if that, on a retail shop. Push, if that doesn't work. Pull, if that doesn't work. We must be closed. <laughs> and finally, on a public restroom, I saw it there. Men to the left, because women are always right. <laughs> so shift does happen. I mean, without change, communities die. You know, we've done a lot of work in the steel belt in the Midwest. I mean, granted, you're, you're, you know, you're not in the steel belt, but you're part of that economy. And, you know, it's hard for people. We came from an industrial background. It's hard to make this shift. But you need to upscale your offerings to match this hotel. And when you start upscaling the offerings in your retail and everything, I mean, you have I think you have too many secondhand stores and kind of low-end stuff. 
it kind of says that you have kind of a low-end demographic. Sometimes you have to change the demographic. Now, we've heard people say, oh, no, we need to cater to the people that are already here. Yes, I think it's important that your, your locals break you even, but I think you also want to upscale. Up, you want to get more people that will come here that have the money to invest, will create their own jobs. I mean, that, and then when it comes to visitors, the more you do that, I'd rather have you have fewer people spending more money when it comes to tourism. You know, when, when people come over that bridge or come down 23 and they come into town, we need them to stop. And by the way, if you can get visitors to spend two hours spending doubles, two hours into doubles. So let me throw the remote on the ground. The heart and soul of any community besides its people is its downtown. So in the end, Here's to the extraordinary bright future Ashland's downtown economy. And you know what? You could do everything we talked about in three, three years. You could physically narrow that street. I mean, I think it's a state highway, but I think they've given control back to the city. You narrow that street down, and I know there's going to be people say, but I commute from here. I already sit in that line coming down Winchester to get over the bridge. You know what? I'm so, you know what? And what the whole thing is, you're talking about you're still talking about cars and transportation and not people. And so I know that's not, it's not easy, you know, and, and you got to do it. You just have to do it. And I think that you can. I think there's a can-do attitude here. Um, I think that, you know, I, I mean, what you have is pretty phenomenal. And we, you know what? We didn't even talk about the river. Because I think if you concentrate on these five blocks and on 16th, if you concentrate on that for the next three to five years, all of a sudden there's going to be investment on the river. There's going to be, there are already major employers looking here. Now what you got to do is show them, here's what we're going to do in the next three to five years. Then our employees are going to love this. We're going to have no problem recruiting jobs. That's what you want them to take away. Because they're not here because you have cheap land. They're here because employees and their workers want to be here. And you'll attract the best talent when you have the best quality of life. So that is all I have for you. So <laughs> does anybody have any questions? I don't mind hard questions either. But to, to start the conversation, just a second, EB, let me just do one. I want to talk about parking for a minute. Because this always comes up, is about parking. Because in many towns, we don't just say narrow the street and put in angle of parking. We say get rid of the parking on your main thoroughfare. Or we say, I want you to create a plaza and get rid of the parking there. And here, let me give you two things about parking, just because I want to address that one. That always seems to be the elephant in the room. Um, I got to say, I was staying at this hotel. So I drove in. I, I, I turned down, which is the street over on this side of the hotel? Which, 15th? Is it 15th and 16th? 14th and 15th flank the, the, the hotel. I turned down 14th, but I couldn't really. I turned down 15th. Oh, 14th one way, okay. I hope I didn't turn down that way. <laughs> so anyway, I turned, probably turned down 15th, and I couldn't figure out where to park. And so then I come down 15th, and I turn into the what I consider the back of the hotel, and it said valet only. And I'm going, but there's a huge parking lot that's empty. There's a bunch of cones there. I go, where's the self-parking? He go, we don't have self-parking. He said, you can park on the street. I said, but that's two-hour parking. He says, well, they don't check it at night. I said, but I'm here all day tomorrow, and I need a place to park. Is it two-hour parking out there? And then, and then I said, well, you know, I really, you know, I pay $12 a night to park here. You know, I'm on the city's budget here. You know, I'm trying to do something. He said, well, why don't you just park here in the handicap spots? Because, you know, we own them. I go, well, you know what? I don't care who owns them. It's still illegal to park in a handicap. Am I right? Where's the words? I saw a police department here somewhere. Am I right? So I parked there and all night long going, I'm going to get a ticket. I'm going to get a ticket. I know I'm going to get a ticket. And they said, no, we own it. We control it. And I go, well, you know what? Hotels are required to put in handicap spaces for handicapped people. 
So this, so you know what I had to do is the next morning, Tuesday morning, I moved my car because I did not feel good about that. But I found another place where I don't think there was two-hour parking over by the old post office. And my car's still sitting over there. I hope that's okay. Because it didn't say two-hour parking on that. But here's the whole point about that is also, if you ever have a merchant come to you and say, you take away the parking in front of my business, you're going to kill my business. Here's what you need to tell them. Are you telling me your business isn't worth walking a block for? Shut them up just like that. Another statistic. The average shopper at Walmart, I had to go double check my figures last night. The average shopper at Walmart parks 240 feet away from the front door. Average. That means half of them are parking further. Yet people have no problem walking that 240 feet to the front of Walmart and then walking all the way to the back to buy a Blu-ray or a DVD. They just walk two blocks to buy a movie. So this whole parking thing is we have to, as Americans and stuff, you have to get out of the mentality that everything is about cars in an age where we want pedestrian. So, but by putting in that angle in parking in your downtown, losing any parking on 16th or Jed Park, you'd more than make it up. I even went down that little piece of, of 16th and I went in and oh my gosh, I'd love to see the bank get rid of that little customer. There's a little parking lot kind of back in there, you know, and then I know there's a few spaces for the church and stuff like that. And I was going, man, if you gave my angle in parking out front, it would more than make up for that and be even more pedestrian friendly. So that's, I just want you to think about people, not cars. And they call theirs so Evie. First of all, thank you for an outstanding presentation. Oh, thank you. You're talking about moving us from the old paradigm to yes. a new way of thinking, and that's what we have to do. Yes. You know, we've got to get out of If you don't change, you die. Absolutely. If you don't change, you die. Uh, first question is, we've all, many of us who are older here, have served on the committees with all the good intentions and seen the plans. We've seen the dust on the shelves with the strategic plans. What I've found is you get the ideas down, but how do you get across that abyss to that action plan where you actually start taking action? Number one. Yes. And number two, without being unkind, and, and how do we kindly handle this situation? What do we do about the vagrancy problem, okay. which is why you don't see benches in front of the buildings? Okay. Ooh, that's a good question. Okay. <laughs> First one. First of all, I don't believe in executive summaries. And you know what happens is with these strategic plans, we read the executive summary, we never read the rest of the plan. I mean, I, I really even have a problem with comprehensive plans, and you're going through the, comp I'm here to help guide, or to help provide some things that might end up in your next comprehensive plan. In Kentucky, you're required to update your comprehensive plan every five years. Okay, so, so, but the problem with comprehensive plans, they tend to be really general in nature. I mean, I looked through yours, and I read the summary of the executive plan and everything, and it sounds like the same thing I read in every single community. You know, got to take advantage of the river, we got to be, you know, and a lot of things. And so I'm not taking fault at the people who do it. That's just the nature of general plans is they're very general in nature. So this is getting down to an action plan where you have a vision. And you say, in the vision, you say, imagine Ash downtown Asheville, Kentucky in 2023, 2022. Yeah, 2023, three years. Imagine if we had the wide sidewalks and we had 10 restaurants in these five blocks that had outdoor cafes all summer long. Imagine if we had places for street vendors, musicians in four different places downtown. Wouldn't it be cool if, and by the way, if you went with music, wouldn't it be cool if you did, we want to do a, a walk of stars, you know, like the Hollywood Walk of Fame, you know, of, of the Judds and Billy Ray and, and other musicians and famous people that are from here, and they're not just musicians. But wouldn't it be cool if we did that? Wouldn't it be cool if, and what you do is you show the vision. You might even have some visuals. People can always grasp the vision, but an executive summary, sell the vision and then follow it with a to-do list. This is a plan that sits on your desk, not on a shelf. Every, every recommendation would say this. Here's a description of it. Here's how much it would cost, or no, Here's a description of it. Here's when it would be done. So they're put in chronological order. Your table of contents should be a to-do list. Then when would it be done? 
Who's going to take the lead? Everybody plays a role. It could be Kiwanis, Rotary. They're really good for putting benches downtown, and I'll get to the vacancy in a minute. So then who would take the lead on it? Is it schools? Is it, it, can't, it doesn't always have to be private, public sector. Everybody always says the city has to do this, Department of Transportation has to do this, county has to do this. Well, what about Kiwanis and Rotary or schools or anybody else? Who would do it? So we got a description of it, when it would be done, who would do it, the approximate cost, where the money would come from, the, and what to do specifically, the details, and the rationale for doing it. That's an action plan. And you can do a recommendation on a page and a half. And so what happens is the Alliance has their list. Uh, um, uh, the Ashland in motion downtown would have their list. The city has their, everybody has their list. All of a sudden there's, how you doing on your list? How you doing on your list? And by the way, they're on this team. And that team's job is to implement that plan. My first thing was Ashland in motion, where is she? Okay, I thought, man, maybe we could take Asha Motion, which is really downtown focused, right? Maybe we take Asha Motion, downtown focused, maybe we combine tourism with it, because you really, you have a county tourism, but you really don't have an Ashland tourism. Oh, oh you do have Ashland tourism, and what's it, is it part of the alliance? No, it's its own entity. It is its own entity, okay. But maybe, I'm not one for creating more and more organizations, but, so in the case, you say, okay, we already have somebody that does does the downtown, that's the focus. So we say, okay, your job is to help, you know, to help um, implement this plan with this team. So this team has to be, they don't just come to a meeting every month. So it might be a change in board members, it might be creating a whole new one. I don't know what, somewhere, that's what we're going to decipher in the next couple of days. But you do need this team, the Destination Ashland team, whatever it is, you change the name of an organization. And that's your whole focus, is making this destination for investment, it's a place to live and a place to visit. And, and I think by having that, I think you'll get things done. I think what happens is you get broad recommendations without the how-to, and then you kind of, you know, we, and then what happens is the enthusiasm dies away, and there are towns where they say, Roger, we need you to come back twice a year to pump everybody back up and run through the red tape. I mean, whatever it takes to make it happen. Um, so now, I hopefully answered that a little bit. Um, vagrancy. We used to live in Olympia, Washington, about an hour south of Seattle, state capital city. And in Olympia, our office was right downtown, and they had a soup kitchen across the street. Soup kitchen should never be in the heart of a downtown. And neither should Salvation Armies and those. I mean, and they all play a vital role. As a matter of fact, I mean, it's wander here just for a second because I just popped into my mind. I think you should do a zoning overlay over Winchester for these five blocks so that this is more destination retail. And then you have neighborhood retail could be, you know, down near the water or the other direction. I can't remember the streets, you know, but could be. So you have the things that cater local are kind of clustered together and the restaurants and things on Winchester are kind of clustered together. And then what you do is you work with the property owners on recruiting the right business mix. If you think about the best towns, Berea, Paducah, Covington, um, Bowling Green, I mean, their downtown is all pretty much orchestrated with like businesses, and I think you need to do that. Now, back to vacancy. In the case of Olympia, we had a soup kitchen right across the street and everything, and then we had a transit station, and there was people hanging out there, vagrants, and we also had drug dealing. But they had a speaker system, they had a big sound system there at the transit station, so when buses came in, they could say, bus going here, blah, blah, blah. I said, you know, can you hook that up to a sound system? They go, oh, yeah, there already is a sound system. Could we pipe some music through it? And they said, yeah. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pipe classical music into it, and within 24 hours, it was gone. They did not want to hang out where there was classical music playing. It was gone. Now, case history number two is we're working in a place called Cardston, Alberta, a town of about 7,000. And we had a big meeting, and they said, Roger, you said to put benches out. We have six benches downtown, and they have, an, in, in, in Canada, uh, the Native Americans are called First Nations people, and, or Aboriginals. And they had a lot of the First Nations, they had a, a, a problem there with their First Nations people that they were hanging out on those six benches, and they were asking for money, they were panhandling. And they said, if we put out more benches, we're just going to have more of them. It's just going to make it even worse. And we already don't know what to do. I said, I'll tell you what. I want you to put out 15 more benches, or 14 more benches, so you have 20 benches. 
And if they take up all 20 benches, I will pay for the benches. What happened is they put out 14 more benches and all of a sudden there was other people sitting on those benches and all of a sudden the, 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 those six benches, they were a minority, not the majority, not 100% of the benches, they were a minority. And within three months, where people hang out consistently, the vagrants go somewhere else. So, and that's the thing, is that after that, pretty soon they were down to like one or two benches. And they still have one or two benches, they have vagrants on them, they're not allowed to panhandle. And you know what? No longer an issue because they have 18 benches full of regular people. So that's another one. So I, you know, and that's exactly, that was the very same question you asked, E.B., is exactly what they said was why should we put out more and what do we do about that? This is a very complicated thing because these are human beings. They're actually hum they're human beings. And so a lot of times, you know, what you do is say, well, you know what, we're creating these, you would call them safe spaces now um, and, and creating places for them. And I think you have to treat them. And so it's not like we're trying to boot them out of town and everything. But I just know that in the case of Olympia, Washington, that the drug dealing kind of stopped. And there's a difference between drug dealing and vagrancy, by the way. They're two different groups, basically, but they tend to intermingle together. So sometimes it's music. Sometimes it's getting people there. That's why if you create Jed Plaza and you do no program, it's a pretty park, every day when the bank closes there, you're going to have them hanging out at the park because it's where they hang out. But if you have a lot of activities there, they're not going to hang out there. They're going to hang out somewhere else. You know, it may be up a couple of blocks. It may be somewhere else. I mean, it's a problem all over the country. Um, and some cities have a real challenge with it. But I think there are many, I could even go through some other examples. But, but that is a, is a challenge in some places. But once again, I think you have to treat them like humans, but I also think that you have to discourage them from being hanging out too much in your five blocks. And we work in many cities where they're not allowed to panhandle. But there are also cities, like Seattle created a thing called Fair Start, F-A-I-R and F-A-R-E. And what they do is they created a kitchen. And, and it was a dilapidated old restaurant. They created this kitchen. They invited in Wolfgang Puck, Jamie Oliver, all these world-class chefs. They come in for three weeks. They take homeless people off the street. They put them in tuxedos. They clean them all up. They dress them all up. And then they, these world-class chefs donate their three weeks. And it's white table linens in this place. And then they come in there and they learn how to cook, they learn how to serve, they get a new lease on life, they're photographed, and two-thirds of them have gone from homeless to jobs because they got a new lease on life. And by the way, if you'd like to make a restaurant reservation at Fair Start, it's a 10-month waiting list. I mean, there are ways to, to, to deal with that problem. It's something you have to address, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. We have an urban mall, not a suburban mall. Okay. And it's four blocks from the downtown area. Okay. Which, to me, could be an advantage because you have a huge, we're a retail center. We have probably 80% of our retail comes from across the river or from other parts of eastern Kentucky. You serve this whole area. Yeah. So how do we draw folks from that four block area to this downtown area? Or how do we connect them so that you have an urban mall and a downtown area and both of them succeed? Well, first of all, this city needs a wayfinding system. This afternoon when we meet, we're going to talk about that. Right now, when you come over that bridge, I have no idea where Ashland is. I don't know whether to turn right, go straight, turn left. There's no wayfinding. Yeah, I saw one little green sign tacked onto a pole for the museum somewhere, but there's no wayfinding. There's no even wayfinding that tells you if you even have public parking anywhere in Ashland. So you do need a wayfinding system. That system should say. And by the way, this downtown district, you should give it a name. You know, this little five blocks of Winchester should be, if you give it a name, it makes it a destination, not a designation. Like Gastown in Vancouver, BC, uh, Pearl Street Mall in Boulder, um, the, the, the French Quarter in New Orleans. So you give it a name. But on those wayfinding things, you should say, what's the name of the mall? Ashland Town Center. Okay, and you put Ashland Town Center Mall on the wayfinding sign to let people know. Because when I got to about 18th, I figured, well, that's pretty much it. Because now I just see fast food, Wendy's, McDonald's, all that stuff. And, and I actually drove down there.
But I, there was nothing to incentivize me to keep going. I didn't even know there was a mall down there until yesterday. There's no wayfinding. So once we think we're leaving downtown, why keep going? Now, I will give you a really great example. Because remember what I said about regional, and, and I heard from lots of people that, that the mall's doing okay. We were working in Bellevue, Washington. There was a mall called Crossroads Mall. It was more, uh, there's Bellevue Square, which is the high-end mall in the Seattle area. But Crossroads Mall was dying. It was 90% vacant, so it's not like your mall. 90%, you know what they did? They put inside, it's all full like food vendors, almost like food trucks, but they're permanent. They have 16, they have they have Brazilian, they have sushi, they have all these, and they're just little, little teeny restaurants with a big common dining area. And they made it, and they put a center stage in there. They have the big chess sets. They did everything they're talking about in a plaza in the mall. And now there's grocery stores, there's bookstores, the whole mall, there's 100% fall, and it's because they made it a community living room, a second one. So, and, and by the way, the mall does not need to compete with downtown. Downtown is about Etsy style shops, the little ones, and everything. so they're, they're not competing. They're a different set of businesses. And so there's no reason why they can't work together. Your downtown is where we go after work a weekend. Your downtown is about dining and entertainment and culture more than it's about shopping. And so I think that can work really well together. But even malls are starting. I always say that the, the more experiential malls are doing quite well. The utilitarian malls, where we just go there to go to a certain store, are the ones that are dying because we're losing the anchor tenants of Macy's and Sears and Penny's and all of those as they all struggle. Yeah. So, yes. These are good questions. Thank you. And for coming, I feel like there have been several times that I wanted to stand up and just scream and cheer. Amen. Yeah, so I was kind of in church this morning. Um, just, I want you for just a second to speak to good strategies that cities like us can use to foster public-private partnerships, TIF districts, those sorts of things, and how those really bring growth. Yes, and, and the first thing is creating that team. Because right now the way it works is you have the Ashland Alliance, which I believe is the Chamber of Commerce. They do their thing. You have economic development and planning are together, but they're doing their thing, even in City Hall, right? Then you've got the, the, the commissioners, you've got uh, Mike, your city manager, and, you know, and as a city manager, he's got to kind of oversee the whole thing. And I'm glad you're a manager council form of government. That's really important if that ever comes up. Because when you have a $50 million budget, it's good to have a professional. So I have a feeling that's how it has come up. OK, so um, I mean, you know, think about it. It's, it's a business. But we are in the age of public-private partnerships. This hotel's one. Um, I mean, if it wasn't for the public sector helping invest this through the tax increment financing, this would never be in a town like Ashland. And, and so, but now you've got another one that might be the, the building right next door that, it, you know, maybe that's turned into a parking garage and a, and a conference center, which would be fantastic. Now what you need is things, people go to conferences where there's things to do after six. So now the best thing you could ever do for this hotel, and this is what, a $20 million plus investment, would be to give them a downtown that's open after six. And so I, I, by, I think it's the city's job to help bring its citizens downtown because that's part of quality of life. That's the mayor, the commission. Their job is to improve the quality of life. Let's create the community living room. Let's bring people downtown. And that creates the impetus for the, for the say, if you're going to bring customers to my door, I'm going to invest in my building. EB's doing it on the hope that will bring people to his front door. And that's not cheap either. I mean, there's workers in there five or six days a week. He's in there almost every day, plus his other job. And, and so I think that we are in the age of public-private partnerships, and that's why we're a proponent of tax income and financing. I know there's people who say we're putting money, private money, we're putting public money into private businesses, which isn't, it's, what it is, you're delaying the taxes, so to speak. But you know, sometimes you have to create these incentives. There's only three or four states in the country that don't do TIF districts, tax increment financing. That's one example of public-private. 
I think another example of public-private is the city doing, the, like I said, the curbside beautification, street trees and the things that make the wider sidewalks, what you've done in some of the side streets, like down 16th, I think. Um, but now it's up to the private sector to do the facade side. It has to be, and when I work in downtowns, I always say, which, if we're going to take Winchester for five blocks, the block where the private sector is most willing to play with us is the block we're going to do first. That means the, the property owners are going to change the business mix when leases expired so that we have more destination retail. And, and I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. And, and, so, and then you say, if you will play with us, then we're going to use your block as the first one. This is all public-private. And, but I think creating that team that has the city on it, it has merchants on it, it has tourism on it and everything is a great way to start because at least we're all in the, we're working together then. And I think that's a great way to do it. Now, to make downtown a draw in these, in three of your five blocks, this is the minimum you need to have if you want your downtown to be a destination. It's called the 10-10-10 rule. 10 places that serve food. And it doesn't all have to be sit-down restaurants. You can count the restaurant in here. Uh, we ate, well, let's see. And I, it's not very, I don't think you have 10. Okay? But you need to have at least 10 in, these, in three of the five blocks. You need to have 10 destination retail shops. You don't have that either. Out of those 20, you need to have at least 10 of them open after six. And that is the one thing. So where you have a cash store or uh, uh, businesses, you know, I mean, no offense to law firms and no, by the way, no offense to any business that's downtown because that's our lunch traffic. We want them downtown, but can we move them up a block or can we move them upstairs if you're a service-oriented business? And by the way, it doesn't mean you can't have any service-oriented businesses on the street. As long as we have enough room for those 10 places to eat and 10 destination retail shops. I mean, EB, his, your shop, when you're done, you might have one or two or three. You don't, I mean, right now, he's not at the point of whether are we going to have a mass general. That's equivalent to about six all by itself because it's a big, it's the biggest space downtown. And, and depending on what you put in there. In Asheville, North Carolina, they took an old Woolworth store and they made it an art market. And it's got all the little booths, and it's got like 50 of them, and it's not an antique mall, it's all art, and everything is locally crafted within, within their county. And so there's things like that you could do. But, um, but and that's going to be a big topic of discussion for us, is we need to reorganize some of this business mix, because even if you narrow the street, here's what you have to understand. You could spend millions of dollars narrowing Winchester, you can add more street trees, you can add benches and everything, and you can still be dead as a doornail. Because at the end of the day, it's what's in the buildings that makes you a draw. And right now, when I walked up and down Winchester, I didn't see much in the terms of retail or restaurants that I would just walk into. You know, that's why I was picking on the, the arcade, because it, it's fantastic once you walk in there but there's no consistency. I mean, there's even service businesses in there. It should be, you will never go to a successful mall and find an attorney's office or a laundromat, right? They have to orchestrate the business. So does the arcade, you know? And they need to have some consistent hours because I understand why people don't go, why a lot of people don't go in there. And I feel so bad for the merchants that were there yesterday with no customers, but at least they're open. You know, and so, uh, so anyway, I hope that answered your question about that. But yes, we're in the age of public private partnerships. City can't do it by itself. Tom, the two things that you hit on yesterday, part of the same thing right in that, or uh, tied to that, is the signage, uh, the outward facing signage. And yes. then also, um, the parking, as I understood your discussions yesterday and also at the KLC, was yeah, there, is, there are time limits downtown yes. uh, on parking but there are viable options for people to go to that are within a reasonable walking distance, however you define that. Can you can yes. that a little first, bit? First of all, we think that two-hour parking is a good way to kill a downtown. However, 
if you're in front of a bank or something, we could see, and I don't think a downtown should have 15 minutes in front of the post office, 30 minutes in front of a bank, an hour over here, two hours over here. It just makes it confusing and a nightmare for people. And by the way, anybody who ever gets a parking ticket in your town is going to write you off, even though they were wrong and broke the law. That's what they do. They just said, forget that. So a couple things is wherever you say to our parking, there should be a sign right there where that says all day parking next left or next right. I mean, I was envious looking at the bank's parking garage going over there and going, oh man, I wish that was more open to the public. Or the one creating next to the hotel, my, I can't remember which way I'm facing here, is, is, is creating that a parking and conference area would be really great. I mean, we should go up. And by the way, parking doesn't have to be free, it has to be worth it. So like a parking garage, you can say, okay, we're going to do a dollar an hour for three hours, and after that it's free. We've seen cities do this model. You know what it does? It incentivizes people to stay longer because after three hours, it's free. In Covington, in Newport on the levee, they have kind of a, if any of you have been there, they have kind of an underground parking. On weekends, they did this. I don't know if they're still doing it. And they said, on weekends, if you come in, if you spend more than $20, we'll, we'll give you the parking for free. People will go in, two people will go in, they'll go watch a movie, it's 15 bucks, and they'll go find a way to spend the other five so they could save the $3 on parking. Really, because then they got something for their money. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do that. So with your parking, number one is you do have some public parking, but even when we walked by it, I saw a hotel said valet parking in the parking lot, and it's a public parking lot. You know what I'm talking about? Not the one behind the hotel, the one out across the street. And it says, so when I go by there and it says valet parking for the hotel, I'm going, well, is there any public parking in this town? Is there any? There's no mark. They're, they're not marked. There's no wayfinding sign. So that's what you need to do. Sometimes parking is more of a fallacy than a reality. But like me, I have no idea where it is. I'm a visitor. I had no idea. I came in here Monday night and I'm going, I, I, I don't know where to park. I mean, I, you know, so, so, you know, I parked in a place I shouldn't have been in. I was shocked that they told me to park there. But, um, you know, and I could have paid the 12 bucks, but it was more. But here's the deal. If people come in and are frustrated, they're going to spend less, less money, and they start off with a poorer experience. I didn't because I get it. It happens to me all the time. But it's, I travel 250 days a year. Um, and so, but, but for like your public parking across the street, there's nothing that says public parking. All I see is little sandwich boards that say valet parking for the hotel, so I assume that's not even public. And I was shocked that that was over there, considering there's valet parking behind the hotel that's half empty. And I'm not here to criticize the hotel. They do a, this is a fabulous place. I love it. Um, and they do a great job. Their staff, everybody's been really good. So did I answer that? You did. The, the first part of it, though, was uh, you made an observation when you were in front of the hotel. You looked to the left, you looked to the right, and there was nothing to entice you to go down. And you made right. comments about the plane signs. Here's the thing. When we walk down a sidewalk or drive down a street, let me just show you. I know that I'm out of time, but I'll do this one and then, and then I'll let you go. But I wanted to show you, oh, go over here. What, what I see on the computer is different than what you see. And so I want to show you one of these. Let me drag this over here. And I'm just going to show you this one because this is important for you that are merchants. Where's my pointer? There it is. Okay, let me get down here. It is Blade Signs. Here we go. And this is one of the 20 ingredients on outstanding downtown. This is the rule of Blade Signs. These are Blade Signs. When we're coming down a street, we see signs that are perpendicular to us. The only way I would ever see the Murphy, your, your building, the sign that you did way up there, which is really cool, it was across the street. Even for like the Highlands Museum, the only way I would see that is across the street because it's on the awning out here. There's no blade signs. Now, the, the, the Alliance and Visitor Information has a small blade sign under their awning. It's a little bit small, but at least it's there. And so what happens is when I, when, when I was on, when we were walking, the mayor and Mike and Catherine and I, we were walking downtown, and I look down the side and I say, there's nothing that gives me incentive to walk down there. There's no blade signs. There's nothing. There's no beautification. There's no incentive for me to keep going down there. So your merchants should have blade signs. 
And those are by, and by the way, something else here. Chocolate collectibles, trains, restaurants. A lot of your blade signs, when they say the name of a store, I can't remember, Lucy's or whatever it is, there's a women's fashion store, has the name of a store. I don't even know what you're selling. Your sign should always say women's fashion is not the name of the store. What is the lure to get me to look in or to come into your store? And that was missing. That's in Leavenworth, Washington. This is Nantucket. Notice similarity in size or height. This is it from a different area, angle. But the point is, no lower than seven feet, no higher than nine feet, and usually no wider than 42 inches. That's a general rule of thumb. But there's no blade signs at all. I mean, there's one or two, but that's it. I mean, the Paramount, you can miss, you, it's no problem with the marquee there, and it's obvious what it is. But generally, anything above 14 feet, we can't see from a car. Because the, the windshield, the, the height of the windshield. So we can't see those high signs. You need to have blade signs. And if you do them consistent height and size, then it's not sign clutter. And if you go to Greenville, North Carolina, South Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina, all these cities and towns, uh, Gatlinburg, all of these places, they all have blade signs. And that's something that's really missing because if we walk down your street, I don't know what's down there, and there's nothing to tease me in. So that's blade signs. So, any last minute questions? Okay, sure. You said you used to need 10 restaurants in a three of the five block area. We have limited liquor licenses in America. Is that possible? Now, every restaurant doesn't have to have a liquor license, but is it going to be possible to do that with a limited number of liquor licenses? Um, it's going to make it very difficult because the liquor is the highest profit margin. Um, and we, we worked over in Lebanon. I actually was Lebanon, Kentucky. I went in there and said, it's really good to be here in Lebanon. A lady instantly stood up, we are not the country. We're Lebanon. Um, and they were a dry town. Well, they were a wet town, and that's where people used to go drinking even when they were underage. And then they kind of took it away, and then they brought it back. But it's really, really difficult for restaurants to make it without the ability to sell at least beer and wine. And we believe outdoor cafes should be able to sell beer and wine as long as you have a fenced off area. We don't believe that you'd necessarily need to sell hard booze out there, but wine and beer actually pair with food. And so if you want to do outdoor cafes, let them eat outdoors as long as you have those too. Um, um, but I think that the liquor, this is a problem we've had. We work in many states where they have the liquor licenses are numbered by the state and they go for millions of dollars. Um, I don't know what all the laws are in Kentucky, but that does, does make it difficult for restaurants, particularly higher-end restaurants, which is what you're trying to attract. Now, it doesn't mean we need to have all fancy restaurants, you know, white, white linen. I mean, we, we, I know your demographic and everything, but, it, it, um, but I think that is something you have to address, and I don't know if that's done locally here at the city level, but I think um, it makes it really hard to get a good restaurant without without the ability to sell at least. Sometimes, are, are there two different liquor licenses, one for hard and one for soft booze? Different different districts can allow the city in different types. Yeah, but okay. In this five blocks, that's why I say if it had a zoning overlay, I would certainly allow liquor to be in those five blocks, you know, particularly for food restaurants. And I do believe that even microbrews and stuff, we've worked in other cities, we always say, you know what, you need to sell at least 50% of your revenue needs to be from food. I get those kinds of things. I think you have that here. Um, and I think those are, I think those are a good way. You also have a number of churches in your downtown. Um, you know, but usually people are pretty good about Sundays, you know, not out there drinking. But, but still, that's why I think that, you know, in this five block, I think restaurants need to be able to sell liquor. That's a, that's a big profit margin. And I, you know what? I don't even drink, so so I'm not saying this. I'm just thinking of it from economics, the economics of a restaurant, not the moral standpoint. That that needs to be changed. It does. I think it would have to be changed. Well, oh, that's why I say do a zoning overlay. You don't have to give it to everybody in the city. You do it in this five block area. Love food trucks. Now, here's what I hear from restaurants. You bring in food trucks, you're competing with my restaurant. And I'll walk into a restaurant and say, you know what? Do you compete with McDonald's? And they go, of course not. I said, then you don't compete with food trucks. It's a different experience. However, I don't think it's, if you had a Mexican restaurant, for instance, or a barbecue, we ate at Blazers. Is that, did you get that right? We ate at Blazers, and I know they sell barbecue there, right? Barbecue ribs. 
Well, I think that would be unfair to put a, a barbecue food truck in front of their restaurant. I mean, that would be, you know, but I think that food trucks are fantastic for downtown. They're a great way to get started until you get your 10, 10, 10. Um, food truck, people all over the United States, food truck festivals. We have in one town of Sulphur Springs, um, Texas. What a name, Sulphur Springs. And in Sulphur Springs, that reminds me of something. In Sulphur Springs, we didn't have enough restaurants. So we brought in food trucks to help supplement. And as the restaurants multiplied, we reduced the food trucks down. But then, for an experiment, we brought in a food truck festival with 35 food trucks. 35, and there was like 12 restaurants in their downtown. And guess what? The restaurants did double the business. Because it, it brought in more people, and, and fewer of them were at the food trucks, and the restaurants were all full. Because we have two choices. They don't compete with each other. So I love food trucks. Controversial, I know, but yes. Absolutely. With mu I mean, if you go with music and some of those things, churches absolutely play a role. Um, and I think churches are good stewards because they're about quality of life as well. I mean, beyond just everyday quality of life, you know. And so I think churches do it. And your churches in your downtown are beautiful. And I know some of them, I've heard they're struggling. That happens. I think generally churches should be in the neighborhoods where the people live more. But you have these beautiful historic churches. We've also seen churches turn into restaurants, theaters, and everything, and they're fabulous. They're just incredible. Um, but I think they do play a role. I think they play an important role. You know, I mean, if I'm sitting there drinking and, and I'm sitting in front of a church or across the street from one, I'm probably going to think, you know, I'm probably going to, I mean, it can be that little hint of, I better lay off of this, you know, or whatever. <laughs> so sometimes it creates what we call the guilt. Yeah. That brings me to one more thing, is in your downtown and in, for Jed Plaza when it gets done, public restrooms. Let me just show you one last one, I promise. Is, is, uh, let's see, where is that, is that? I think I have it somewhere. Maybe it's down here, parking, public restroom. Relieved visitors spend more, and I'll just do this one, quite frankly, because my wife loved this, <laughs> even though we made it up. In London, that's a public restroom. It's, it's about the corner of this table, about this, so about two or three times the size of a telephone booth. It's all glass right there. Sulphur Springs, Texas, two of these in their downtown, it revitalized their downtown. Because that's it from the outside. You can see the reflection of all the mirrors and everything. This is it from the inside. It's one-way glass. <laughs> How many of you would have the courage to use that restroom? <laughs> I have to tell you, this is my potty humor for the day. I was in Sulphur Springs, and I went in one of those, and I could not let go. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. I just, I can't do this. I'm trying. But they put two of those in Sulphur Springs and they put out on the highway. Uh, uh, famous see-through restrooms. And so many people came into their downtown to see these. It totally revitalized their downtown. They said, wow, this is a cute downtown. While here, we should go in that shop. We should go get something to eat. We should get some ice cream. We should play some chess around it. I mean, so whatever you do, but public restrooms are going to be really important. There's a men's room I found in New York City. <laughs> so we go from churches to talking about tape measures. <laughs> I don't know how I did that, but, but I would also, no business should ever have signs like that. In Wickford, Rhode Island, I love it. There's a little sign right, first of all, there's a sign here that says, your husband called, he said to spend whatever you want. Smart merchant. But there's a little sign right there, oh, right here on the window. Never say no, tell me where I could go. So the one thing we got to do is make sure that you have public restrooms somewhere. Because if you want people, it'd be like, remember I said your community living room? So let's say you invite people over to your house, and you're going to watch a movie, you're going to play some table games and everything, you say, by the way, you can't use our restrooms. You have to go down three blocks to the nearest wherever. Go to our neighbors, you can use their restroom. So that's one thing that you still have to add to the mix. 
Always put your restrooms where people can spend money because relieved visitors spend more. So with that, thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you very, very much. Yeah.